तबके के साथ इंशाला खड़ा होगा Taliban sympathizer Zaini ghulami ki zanjire todna zyada mushkil hota hai jo abhi Afghanistan mein ghulami ki zanjire to tod di unhone lekin jo zaini ghulami ki zanjire wo nahi tutti A Muslim leader who ignores China's crackdown on Uyghur Muslims China has been one of the greatest friends to us in our most difficult times we respect the way they they are and whatever issues we have we speak behind closed doors a man who has been accused of crushing the poor and ignoring women's rights ye sara jo parde ka concept hai ye kya hai ki temptation na ho maashre mein aap maashre ke andar logon ko yani har insaan ke andar wo hoti nahi hai taakat nahi hoti will power nahi hota aap agar maashre ke andar jitni jitni badhate jayenge fashi और आप इसकी इतियात नहीं करेंगे इसके असरात हैं चीज नहीं इंसान है और घटिया तेरी सोच ने आजी बेहतर शाही काजी है वेरी एंगर्ड एंड वी आर वेरी सैड एट द रिमार्क्स मेड बाय द प्राइम मिनिस्टर इमरान खान अगेंस्ट अस अगेंस्ट पाकिस्तानीज अगेंस्ट द सोसाइटी जो उन्होंने स्टेटमेंट्स दिए हैं वो निहायत ही प्रॉब्लमैटिक है ये निहायत ही हकीकत से रिमूव है वो ये अज्यूम कर रहे हैं कि हर मर्द जो है वो रेपिस्ट होता है और रेप की जिम्मेदारी औरत के कंधों के ऊपर डाल रहे हैं मीट इमरान खान द 22nd प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ पाकिस्तान According to the World Bank, the poverty rate in Pakistan increased from 4.4% to 5.4% in 2020. The unemployment rate is so high that approximately 1.5 million people applied for a single position, the job of a peon after reading a high court advertisement. This is the price that Pakistan is paying for electing a once charismatic cricketer who is now misfielding in his own country. His obsession with media optics has become more important than delivering on his promises. Big words, but little action. Instead of focusing on development, Imran has chosen hardliners and the Taliban for regional prosperity. Recently, Pakistan freed a hardline Islamist leader a week after removing his name from a terrorism watch list. On November 18th, Saad Hussein Rizvi, the chief of a Sunni militant group, Tariq El Abaik Pakistan, was released from jail in Lahore. Truly, a picture of Naya Pakistan, a country where Islamist hardliners have a free pass. After three years of Imran Khan's Tariqe Insaf rule, where is Pakistan heading? Imran Khan is a moron, right? Imran Khan, uh, his wife keeps gins in her house and she feeds them cooked meat, right? Imran Khan is really but a puppet of the military. So, any question that starts with uh, some musing of Imran Khan, I, I, I just tend to disregard it because he has no consequence. There is again uh, lots of speculation going on. uh in fact the the rumors were so rife uh, a week ago that um, people were talking about a immediate change in government or some in house change uh but i don't think uh, it is going to happen pakistan's active involvement in enabling the taliban to capture power in afghanistan is an open secret Pakistan's relationship with the United States has turned sour. More than 10 months have passed since Joe Biden took charge, but Imran Khan is still waiting to receive a courtesy phone call from him. And now Pakistan might lose the support of its strongest trade partner, China. The people of Balochistan are opposing the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Massive protests have erupted in Pakistan's port city of Gwadar. Imran Khan is on a sticky wicket. 
An editorial in Pakistani media referred to him as Pakistan's Gorbachev, the Russian leader who saw the breakup of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. Is Pakistan too on the verge of disintegration? I don't think he's the Gorbachev of uh, Pakistan at all. Uh, he is definitely not very experienced in managing and governing, and that has been now uh, fully exposed in the public. Uh, you know, he uh, he had a lot of rhetoric, populist rhetoric about fixing the country, but he really had no plan. These are the concerns of millions of people staying in the largest province of Pakistan, Balochistan. For the past few days, massive protests were seen in and around the port city of Gwadar, amid the ongoing backlash against China's Belt and Road Initiative. Their discontent with China's presence in the region have been growing every day. They fear their livelihoods will be threatened, particularly from illegal fishing. The Baloch people complain that several licenses have been issued to Chinese trawlers to fish in the waters off the coast, giving no space to their small boats. Their livelihoods are being snatched. Local population in Gwadar demands that uh, their rights should be protected. That mean in as far as foreign investment is coming, Chinese investment is coming, they should be protected, they should be given, uh, they should be on the priority list as far as economic opportunities are concerned. And then there would be massive industrialization, more industries, more jobs, more companies opening. If there is, of course, educated youth in Balochistan, particularly in Goa, that they demand that they should be accommodated in jobs, in the packages, in the industries. China announced an economic project in Pakistan worth $46 billion in 2015, of which Balochistan is an integral part. With the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, Beijing aims to expand its influence in Pakistan and across Central and South Asia, and counter American and Indian influence. Balochistan has an oceanic coastline that stretches along one of the world's most important shipping routes, the Strait of Hormuz. The CPEC would link Pakistan's southern Gwadar port in Balochistan to the Arabian Sea to China's western Xinjiang region. It also includes plans to create road, rail and oil pipeline links to improve connectivity between China and the Middle East. China really does need stability in Afghanistan so that it can get the copper out of ANAC, out of the ground into the market. This is going to be an important project that will connect the Chinese initiative at Gwadar. Because right now, Gwadar is not a terribly cost-effective way of moving material between the Arabian Sea and Xinjiang, China, because things have to come off at Gwadar, they go to Karachi, and then they travel north, right? So, uh, for this to be a truly effective and cost-effective deep sea port, apart from having strategic value, but to have economic value, things have to get off at Gwadar, and they really have to pass through Balochistan and then onto the ring road, right, in Afghanistan. Baloch political parties have termed it a conspiracy and vowed to resist it at all forums. The locals feel while people of other provinces are enjoying the fruits of the mega-project, their interests have been ignored. China has stolen their natural resources and left them out. In October too, thousands of people from different areas of Gwadar and Turbat staged a protest against the non-availability of basic amenities like safe drinking water, sanitation and hygiene. 
Historically, the resource-rich area has been dealing with poverty, a dismal growth rate and poor governance. So how is Imran Khan addressing their grievances? There are reservations by the local people and local political groups about the different projects under the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor. Uh, but, uh, you know, the government at the same time is, is uh, uh, aiming and attempting to address that. And the Chinese authorities are also cognizant of that. Balochistan province has been a host to a long-running separatist movement. Jam Kamal Khan Aliani, the former chief minister of Balochistan, met Imran Khan in October. He quoted the prime minister as saying that Balochistan's progress was among the federal government's top priorities. A month later, these protests reveal a different picture. Inflation, unemployment, hunger and lawlessness are rampant in Pakistan. In recent weeks, hundreds of Pakistani businessmen and civil society members have been staging protests against the Imran Khan-led government over these issues. A cup of tea in Pakistan costs 40 Pakistani rupees. The price of sugar in Pakistan increased from 54 Pakistani rupees per kilo to over 100 Pakistani rupees per kilogram. A whopping increase of 83%. Electricity rates have also increased by 57% from 4.06 Pakistani rupees per unit to 6.38 Pakistani rupees per unit. The price of ghee, or clarified butter, too increased by 108% to 356 Pakistan rupees per kilogram. Liquefied petroleum gas, or LPG, prices have seen a rise of 51% in the past three years, and petrol of 49%. Shocking, isn't it? In the last three years, inflation in Pakistan has broken a 70-year record. It now stands at 9%. Pakistan's uh, economy is the biggest problem at the moment for the last uh, three years or so, and handling of the economy. Part of that is the legacy of the previous governments, but part of it has to do with the unclear and uh, vacillating uh, policy uh, that Imran Khan regime has had. Earlier in November, Imran Khan announced a whopping 120 billion Pakistani rupee or 680 million US dollar plus package for the poor families to buy essential items of daily use at cheaper rates. He described it as the biggest welfare program in Pakistan's history. For Khan's critics though, it was a pack of lies. The rate of inflation in Pakistan is the fourth highest in the world and it has triggered countrywide protests by the opposition and people. Pakistanis took to the streets in Karachi, Larkana, Lahore, Sukkur, Mardan, Jakobabad and Mohmand. Pakistan is in the throes of a deep economic crisis. But what is the government doing? Government every day claims that a number of steps are being taken to ease the economic situation. Our package was also announced that package will are yet to reach to the common man. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF, has agreed to revive a $6 billion bailout package for Pakistan after more than a month of discussions. Signed in July 2019, the program has remained largely off track. To get the bailout package, Pakistan will need to pass amendments that give the government less influence over the central bank and raise taxes. Currently, Pakistan's revenue from taxes is among the lowest in the world. Less than 2% of people in Pakistan pay taxes. Now, 
Pakistan is a, is in negotiation with the IMF for another uh, you know um, round of assistance and I, the IMF as you know imposes very strict conditions particularly with regard to uh, you know devaluation as well as increasing the surcharges and tariffs on uh, uh, petroleum and natural gas and that has caused a lot of hardship and we are seeing a very high inflation rate so i think that's what is uh, uh, is worrying Imran Khan, I'm sure, and uh, has made his government unpopular. The Imran Khan-led government is being forced to borrow afresh to pay old loans. Pakistan's public debt has increased from 72% of GDP in 2017 to 18 to over 87% of GDP at the end of 2019 to 20. The country's external debt is piling up. Saudi Arabia has already sent $3 billion in financial aid to cash-strapped Pakistan. It has also pledged to finance oil derivatives trade worth $1.2 billion soon. Debt servicing has become the biggest problem for the government, as it must borrow continuously to pay back previous debts. In 2018, Khan launched a massive austerity drive. The government auctioned luxury cars and sold buffaloes and cows belonging to the Prime Minister's house. It didn't work, so in 2021, the official residence of the Prime Minister was put on rent. But perhaps the Prime Minister should have focused on his pledge to rid the country of chronic corruption. This particularly Prime Minister Imran Khan's government came into power on the slogan of fighting corruption. But so far, the government has been unable to recover the looted money that is in the European banks, Swiss banks, French banks, British bank. That remains a big challenge. Looted money, it has been, of course, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, who is in exile in London. So there have been a number of other ministers who have been uh, in the cabinet of uh, former Prime Minister, Mr. Nawaz Sharif. There have been number of other political leaders, politicians, former President Asif Ali Zardari is in Pakistani courts. There are cases within Pakistani courts, right? There are, uh, of course, and these cases clearly indicates that number of Pakistani politicians, including former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, right, had looted the money. And then there, recently there was Pandora, Pandora Papers. In Pandora paper, it was uh, also brought to the light that Number of uh, uh, there are number of people within this present uh, government of Prime Minister Khan whose names have appeared in Pandora paper. So uh, the uh, government is uh, right now investigating these Pandora papers. He will uh, get back that money. People will be brought into uh, people will be uh, definitely would be brought to justice. But so far these have, these has been uh, just uh, just brags, just statement and no practical action has been taken. So corruption on corruption front, there is no significant improvement uh, as far as Pakistan Tariqe and Saab government is concerned. The plight of Pakistani minorities has also not changed under Imran's regime. The Hazara minority, a population that stretches across Pakistan and Afghanistan, are Shia Muslims. They are persecuted for their faith in both the Sunni-majority countries. Other minorities too continue to live under the cloud of insecurity and fear. Last year, a mob led by local leaders of a religious party vandalized a century-old Hindu shrine in Karak district of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. The mob of more than 1,000 people set the shrine on fire. हमारे भी जज्बात उतने ही मजरू होते हैं जिस तरह फ्रांस में हो या स्कॉटलैंड में अगर मजहबी खाकों पर आपके जज्बात मजरू होते हैं हमारे भी उतने ही होते हैं मजहब की आप अपने मजहब की भी एहतराम करें और दूसरे के मजहब की भी एहतराम करें हम पाकिस्तानी पाकिस्तानी हैं और अब हमें बार-बार खुदा के लिए अब हमें किसी को सर्टिफिकेट देने की जरूरत नहीं है हमारे लिए यह शर्म शर्म की बात है कि हम पाकिस्तान रहते हैं जब हम अक्लियत और मेजॉरिटी और मिनॉरिटी को एक जैसा समझते हैं जब हम एक जैसा समझते हैं तो हमें एक जैसे हुकूक मिलने चाहिए हुकूक क्यों नहीं मिलते वहां उस एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन की सरपरस्ती में यह हुआ है There are reports of a rupture in civil military relations in Pakistan 
On November 20th, after much dilly-dallying, Lt. Gen. Nadim Ahmed Anjoum finally took over as Director General of Inter-Services Intelligence. He replaced the controversial Lt. Gen. Faiz Hamid, Pakistan's powerful spy chief, who had dashed to Kabul after the Taliban seized power. Imran Khan didn't want to let go of Hamid, who had helped set up the 2018 election for the PTI. But he had to give in to the demands of Army Chief General Kamar Javid Bajwa. However, experts believe his relations with the Army are now beyond repair. Imran Khan enjoyed really full backing of the military and the Army Chief and the DGISI and even the courts, but you know, Recently, on the appointment of DGISI, there were differences and they came out in the open. They became very public. and uh, But now that matter has been solved, ultimately Imran Khan gave in and the, uh, uh, you, you know, the general who was appointed by the uh, army chief has prevailed. Uh, so I'm not so sure how deep is that, so you know, what you call division, but there has been certainly tension. And remember that tension between the civilian ruler and the military is not always a good sign because it, it does at some point lead to a regime change, if you look at our history and recent history. Pakistani media is now openly speculating. How long will the Imran Khan government last? Imran Khan's fate hangs in balance. That the options, alternatives to Imran Khan are still not clear. So until those are not clear, Imran Khan continues and once uh, the, the military gets uh, a better alternative or enters into a deal uh, with its, uh, you know, with the opposition leader Nawaz Sharif, who's, a, who's in exile in London, uh, things are not going to change. So let's see where it goes. Uh, but I think uh, some changes in the offing. <laughs>